Indeed, all praises belong to Allah. They are for Allah, and they should be made exclusively for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the beginning and in the end. In times of prosperity, in times of adversity. When things are going rough, when things are going smoothly, the praises are for Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not only do we believe this, not only is this a reality, but we also proclaim it with our tongues. Just like the Shahada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, alone, without any partner. This is a reality. Point one. Point two, we believe this with our hearts. 
Point three, we profess it with our tongues. All praises are for Allah. That's the reality. We believe that and we also proclaim it with our tongues. We seek Allah's guidance. We beg for His forgiveness and His pardon. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of our souls and from the consequences of our bad evil actions. Those whom Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can mislead them. And those individuals who are misled by Allah, you'll never find anyone who can bring them to that which is correct. I've been witness and I testify with full strength and conviction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone for any partner is the only true God, the only deity who deserves to be worshipped. And I've been witness and I testify with full strength and conviction that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is a chosen slave and his apostle. Oh, you believe, fear Allah, as he should be feared, and in perfect and thorough manner, on a consistent basis, and never die unless you are in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O mankind, fear your Lord and Maker, fear your cherisher and creator, who brought you into existence from one man, one soul, and from that soul, his peer, his partner, his mate, and from that man and that woman, countless men and women of different colors, different races, different ethnic backgrounds, different sizes, weights, and heights, from different countries, different continents, and parts of the world. This is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His greatness, His omnipotence, His power, and His absolute might and magnificence. Is that He made me like this, and He made you like that. This man tall, this man short. This man fair skin, this man dark skin. This woman of this nature, and another woman of a totally contrast nature. With different tongues, different dialects, different means of intellect and communication and articulation. That is one of the greatest signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you realize this, then fear him. Be mindful of him who brought you into existence from one man. Millions of human beings. Billions of human beings. All of them started off with one man. That is an ayah. That's a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be mindful of him. The one whose name you mentioned when you beg for your basic rights, your mutual rights, and stay far from severing the ties of kin. Don't disrespect your mothers. Do not disrespect your grandmothers. Do not disrespect the mother of your children. Do not disrespect your father or your grandfather. Do not separate a woman from her husband at the time of divorce. Allow them to get back together. Do not sever the ties of kin. For indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a raqib. It's someone who hears you, who sees you, who's aware of that which you do. You cannot get away, you cannot hide by splitting up families. Oh, you who believe, fear Allah perfectly and thoroughly. Speak the truth. Be direct. Don't play games. Don't have two tongues. Don't have a tongue like a snake. Don't make a promise one day and you break the promise the next day. Do not lie to this person and speak the truth to another. Do not have two faces. Don't be fake. Be real. Say what you feel and feel what you say. If you do so in the night, Allah will forgive you of your sins. And He will correct your mistakes. Fix your misdeeds. He will rectify your affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who is obedient to Allah, who is obedient to His Messenger, the one who learns the Qur'an, who studies the Qur'an, who teaches the Qur'an, and most importantly, who implements the basic teachings of the Qur'an, is better than a scholar of the Qur'an who is disobedient and sinful. And that is the true meaning of preserving the Qur'an and guiding the Qur'an, not just saying, I'm a hafiz of the Qur'an. I've memorized the Qur'an. I have ijazah of the Qur'an. I have kaza wa kaza juz of the Qur'an. But you're disobedient, you're sinful. You do not stop at a law set limitations. You do not proceed when a law tells you to move forward. You're not a true memorizer of the Quran. But the Muslim who know, he prayed, made the salah, made hajj, fasted, gave zakah, avoided haram, did that which was obligatory and mandatory. He's the one who has preserved the Quran. As the Prophet والسلام, had said in the Quran Kareem, complaining to Allah, he said that my people they have taken this Quran 
as a means of something that is boycotted and abandoned. So the true abandoning of the Qur'an, the true boycott of the Qur'an is not just the recitation or the memorization or the prayer at night, but it's the one who preserves it through his limbs. It's the one who acts upon the Qur'an al kareem And the one who acts upon the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu who obeys, who listens, who submits, who stops when Muhammad says stop, who goes when Muhammad says goes, whether it is mandatory or not, whether it is obligatory or not, whether it was the opinion of my sheikh, my madhab, my culture or not, the slave who does this simple yet advanced thing is the most successful. Not how much money you have, Yaqi. Not how much knowledge you have. How much pieces of information you've collected and compiled. How big your house is. How many children. How many wives. The most successful person is the one who submits to Allah and His Rasul to proceed. The most excellent speech, the most truthful speech is the Qur'an on Kareem, Allah's Qur'an. The most excellent guidance is that of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, his sunnah. And the opposite of that sunnah, the worst thing to do is to take the sunnah and disregard it. And not only disregard it, but now introduce make new things up, create novelties, which are means of misguidance, means of innovations. And all of these things, innovations and misguidances are in the fire of hell. That awful, terrible, wretched, formidable place that we seek Allah subhanahu wa refuge from. My dear brothers and sisters in our Islam, upon us something that is very important, something that is very special. We live in a time, a time right now that many of us unfortunately are losers regarding. We've lost. Some of us are partial losers. Some of us are total losers. May Allah protect all of you from that and myself as well. And that is taking advantage of these seasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger have made special. Taking advantage of the special times the special places, the special opportunities. Every day is a day of Ibadah. Every month, every week, every year, every hour is a time of mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother narrated, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يذكر الله على كل أحيانه أو في كل أحيانه the Messenger of Allah mentioned Allah all of the time. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, when he was asked, when the man came to him, in the hadith has been connected by Imam Ahmad in his Musnad with an authentic chain, he says, Inna al-Islami qad kathrat There's so many rules, so many things, too many for me. Give me something simple and easy, something I can hold fast to, something comprehensive, something basic for me to implement. The Prophet والسلام, he told him, he didn't say a time, a place, a specific situation or circumstance or scenario. He said in a few simple, beautiful basic words, لا يزال لسانك رطبا بذكر الله. He says, continue to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your tongue should never go dry from Allah's remembrance. That's it. No specific time or place. So this is a general rule in our Islam. Allah said to his prophet and his apostle, Worship your Lord. Make servitude of your Lord until certainty comes to you. And what's meant by yaqeen, what is meant by certainty is death, is moat, the ultimate certainty. So therefore, the verses in the Quran, the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, are abundant, ample in number. And we can go on and on quoting them, which all prove one basic thing, brothers and sisters, is that every time is a time for worship. Every time is a time for dhikr. Every time, every place, every month is a time for tawbah, repentance, and seeking closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there are times, there are places, there are seasons which you can get more, which you can enhance your ibadah 
which are more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are fonder to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, greater rewards, more forgiveness of sins. And all of this, or this entire concept, is based off of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran al وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَابُ Indeed, your Lord creates, and your Lord selects that which He wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates, and He selects, not what the slaves want, not what His servants choose, they're fancy, but what He knows, what He desires, based off of His infinite wisdom and knowledge. Allah says, they have no selection. We're slaves of God. Who are we to say what's best? What is best? Who is best? We hear and we obey. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His mercy, He has made special times, special places, better than others. And from these special times are the days that we live in right now. From those special times are the days that I and many of you have wasted and neglected and been heedless of. From those special times is the countless hours Allah has given us in these 10 days. And we continue to make idle talk, continue to make vain talk, continue not to lower our gaze, continue to listen to what we're not supposed to listen to, continue to stay away from Allah's house. And this is unfortunate. And there are many of us, Walilahi alhamd, who are blessed, who are chosen by Allah, who had their eyes, their ears, and their hearts opened up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seize and to take advantage and to grasp these 10 days and realize their importance, realize their virtue, realize what a sweet opportunity Allah Azza wa Jal has endowed you with. 10 days, the Messenger of Allah salatu wasalam, he says, there aren't any 10 days and which righteous deeds are more beloved and more fond to Allah than these ten. The Sahaba, who were the students of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, those who attended his school, attended his institute, his university, the University of Prophethood, they sat around and they had some questions or perhaps some doubt or perhaps something that was unclear. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what is jihad fi sabirillah? Not even fighting in Allah's cause? Because they were taught by Allah's Messenger from the greatest acts was fighting in Allah's cause. They were educated by the Messenger of Allah from the most virtuous deeds was to die in Allah's Allah's cause. So they used what they had to get further knowledge and further clarification. So they had a doubt. And that doubt wasn't a lack of certainty in their iman, but it was a doubt based off of what they had been previously taught and educated. So they said, not even jihad in Allah's cause. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, says, not even jihad in Allah's cause. Except for the man who goes out with his body, his soul, his wealth. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْجِعْ مِنْ ذَٰلِكَ بِشَيْءٍ And he loses both of them. When he loses his wealth, and loses his body and his soul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's cause. That is the only thing that is better than performing righteous deeds during these 10 days. How many righteous deeds have you performed? Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatullahi wa salamu wa ala ibadillahi ladhi nasafa ama ba'd. From the virtues of these 10 days, is that these 10 days include the day of the Eid, the day in which the Muslims congregate, come together. They put aside, inshallah, they put aside their differences. They put aside their means of diversity. And that diversity is a blessing. They come together with one sole united purpose. And that is to mention Allah, to praise Allah, to thank Allah and to enjoy some of his bounties, some of the food, some of the drink, some of the things that he has made lawful for them. As the Messenger of Allah والسلام, prohibited the Muslims from fasting on the days of Eid. He prohibited them and it's haram to fast on the Eid day and the days that come after the Eid. He said, 
ayam aklin wa shurbin wa dhikrin lillah he says the days of tashriq the day of the eid the day after the next and the third he says they are days of eating drinking and most importantly remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so therefore this eid is one of the reasons why some of the ulama of al islam said the 10 days of the hijjah the first 10 days of the hijjah are better than any other days during the entire year not even the days of ramadan are more excellent and some of them say the last 10 nights of ramadan are more virtuous but the days of Ramadan have nothing on the days of Hijjah. Why? Yom al the day of slaughter, the day of sacrifice. Why? The day of Eid. Why? The day of Tarwiyah. Hajj, prayer, fasting, sadaqah, zakat, sacrifice. All of these things can are done and they're performed during these 10 days. And you cannot do those acts of worship in any other time. There's no Hajj in Ramadan. There's Umrah, but there's no Hajj. There is no specific slaughter in Ramadan. You can slaughter for the Eid, for your family to eat food, to give to poor people, but there is no Uqiyah. There is no specific slaughter. The Sunnah of our grandfather, Ibrahim Salam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him, put him through a great trial, just stop and reflect, brothers and sisters. Imagine if you had lived for years out of your life, you had no children, no children. You wanted a son, that's all you wanted was one son. Oh Allah, give me one son. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, out of your, 80 years out of your life. And you begged Allah for one child. And Allah, He gave you exactly what you asked for. And the moment you begin to enjoy your son, and have fun with your son, and show thankfulness and gratefulness for what Allah gave you, Allah gives you a command and an order to kill your son. To take a blade, sharp, razor sharp, and put it against his soft, tender neck. Who would do this among us? Oh Allah, please, no! My son, my child! If you don't believe this, then look what happens at the time of the funerals. How many go cry and well? Why me? He had up my wife, my husband, my father. Why he had been there? So just imagine a young helpless boy, a young helpless infant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to sacrifice him. And this is very similar to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did with Musa alayhi salam and his mother. They lived in a dangerous time, a dangerous place. Pharaoh was killing all of the Israeli children who were boys. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told Musa's mother to place him in a box and put him in the riverbank. One of the largest rivers in the world, the Nile River. Send him away. What woman would do this today? Allah commands the woman with a simple command. Where hijab? Obey your husband. Pray your five salah. Lower your gaze. Don't be disrespectful to your husband. Basic, simple command. Many women cannot do. It's too difficult for me not to say something. Not to become sarcastic. Not to curse you out. Why? When? How? So on and so forth. So simple. This woman gave her child for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah Azza wa He brought back Musa. Not just as a baby, but as a messenger, as someone who was selected and chosen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, ala He said, we fastened her heart. We tied her heart. We solidified and bolstered her heart. In other words, righteousness in a man or in a woman is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, after those long years of supplication, of patience, of pain and agony, he did what Allah commanded him to do. And when he put him down, when Ibrahim, when Ismail, alayhi salam, when he grew up and he was ready for the time of the sacrifice, when he was ready to slaughter him of the age that Ismail had reached, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sadaqta ru'ya. He says, indeed, you have interpreted the dream properly. Allah says, this is how we reward the good doers. 
So when we make this slaughter, we make this sacrifice, it's a means of implementing, reviving the sunnah of Ibrahim and of Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. So therefore, those who wish to slaughter, and some of the ulama of al-Islam, they say, if you have wealth, if you're wealthy, then you must slaughter. And many of the ulama, they say, it is recommended to slaughter, highly recommended, for those who have wealth and for those who do not have wealth. What is important, those who intend to slaughter the following animals, a cow or a bull, a camel, male or she camel, a goat or a sheep, you should slaughter the animal that is fat and healthy, not a skinny, bony, fragile animal. An animal that's free from sickness. It has both of his eyes. If the animal is supposed to have horns, it has two horns, not a half of a horn. It doesn't limp, it doesn't gimp, it's not gimpy, it's not sick. It doesn't have a foul odor or smell. It keeps up with the rest of the animals. It eats well. It relieves itself well. It's a healthy animal that has no sickness and no defect. And it is also recommended to purchase the animal a four time, as many people do overseas. Not like here in America, but many Muslims overseas, they buy an animal a month before they eat. Three weeks before they eat. Not only is the price is lower, not only is it more, and it's less expensive, but they have the ability of feeding the animal themselves and fattening it up and giving it a drink. And this is all from respecting Allah's law. But you don't get an animal that's about to die and pass off. You get a big, strong animal. And if that animal is a cow, it has to be at least two years old. If it's a camel, at least five years old. If it's a goat, at least 12 months. And if it is a sheep or a lamb, then it should be at least six months old. It should be at least six months old. You must have the ability to slaughter this animal in the proper Islamic manner, not causing it pain, not causing it suffering, taking the blade across the throat of the animal and allowing the blood to pour forth. And when you make this sacrificial slaughter, first and foremost, it has to be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not for your wali, not for a sheikh, not for someone in your village, in your country, not for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, Allahumma hadha minni wa ilayk taqabbal minni. Bismillah, in the name of Allah, Allah is the most great. Oh Allah, this is from me to you, please accept. These are some of the supplications that you are allowed and recommended to say at the time of slaughtering. When the animal is slaughtered, it is recommended that you yourself and your family members eat from the animal. And this goes to prove that it's permissible to you for you to eat from the sacrifice. Secondly, you should give meat as sadaqah to your friends and your family members. Thirdly, you should prepare food, prepare meals from the animal as a means of brotherhood and sisterhood in our Islam. This is, or these are some of the recommended acts of the Udhiyah. When you go to the slaughterhouse, we said, first and foremost, the animal should have a certain age, a specific age. We said a cow has to be at least two years, camel, five years, a goat at least 12 months, and a sheep must be at least six months old. You are not allowed to slaughter and offer an animal before the eat prayer. You are not allowed to offer an animal that's sick and limping and has one eye and a missing horn. You are not allowed to slaughter and offer an animal that cannot run, that can barely walk, that cannot keep up with the rest of the flock, no matter what the price is. No matter what the butcher tells you, you are not allowed to offer this animal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Jameel and He loves Jamal. Allah is beautiful and he, uh, and he loves beauty. Allah is tayyib and he only accepts tayyib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fine and perfect and that which he, or that is that which he accepts. So when you go to the slaughterhouse, first and foremost is the selection of the animal. And the best animal without any doubt is the strongest animal, the biggest animal, the fattest animal, that is healthy and in a good state of huh, being. And some of the ulama, they explain, that the best of sacrifice is either goat or sheep. 
Some of them, they say, that's better than a cow and a camel. Because the Prophet, وسلم, that's what he used to offer. Kabshayni, Ablahayni. Two small animals or animals that were goat and sheep. As for a cow and a camel, then some of the ulama, they say, it's best to offer a camel because it's bigger, it's more expensive, it's more meat, and seven people are allowed to come together and join in that big sacrifice. And what's meant by seven people is the man and his household. If you slaughter one animal, it is sufficient for you, your wife, your children, your stepchildren, anyone who lives under your roof, anyone who is a dependent of yours, anyone that you feed and drink, you give them food and drink, you provide for them, then they fall under your sacrifice. Everybody clear on this, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do not learn the basics of the akam, if you don't learn the basics of slaughtering, and you go to the slaughterhouse, and you make a mistake, you make an error, you fall into a blunder, the animal was only five months, the animal had a hidden sickness, a hidden weakness, something that you didn't know about, you will not be excused by Allah. You will not be pardoned by Allah. And that is because you have an opportunity to learn that which is correct, not the advanced knowledge. We have to focus. We have to focus. We have to focus. We have to focus. When you go to the Jumu'ah, the Messenger of Allah والسلام, said, those who listen to the Khatib, who hear the words of the one speaking outside, whatever is going on outside. And I quote once again, and I only say this out of the means of mercy for my brothers and sisters in Islam, and from experience, when you go to the slaughterhouse, or that which is from your culture or your custom that is incorrect, and that is from the Sunnah, you offer an animal, and you did something wrong, you fail to perform a stipulation of the Udhiyah, it is nothing but meat. And you cannot say, oh Allah, I didn't know, I was ignorant. Because you have the opportunity of learning that which is basic. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our worship. I mean, we beg that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept these 10 days from us all. Our fasting, our standing, our recitation of the Quran, anything that we do of good, I mean. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who reach and realize the day of the Eid, that blessed day, I mean. We beg that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us our sacrificial slaughter, I mean. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of the Muslims, I mean. We ask Allah the mighty the majestic to have mercy upon our souls and to forgive us of our sins, Allahumma, I mean. We beg that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to leave this door as better servants and more obedient slaves. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.